I'm speaking about the places, the parts in our society where there are gaps. And in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, this is what God says. He says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. It's God saying, I looked throughout the entire nation for men or women who are willing to stand in the gap, but I didn't find one. Now, this idea of standing in the gap that Ezekiel's talking about relates to a city wall. In the Bible times, and if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see a reference to a fortified town and unfortified cities. And the difference between those two was that a fortified town had got a, a wall around it. And this obviously helped in defense. An unfortified city, well, they pretty much had to run if an army ever attacked them because they knew they had no defense whatsoever. But what happened if on a town that had a big wall, through neglect or through uh, an army invading, a massive gap was to develop in that wall or part of it falls down? Is there would then be a gap. It wouldn't be a secure place. It wouldn't be a secure town anymore. And it's this idea that God's using in the book of Ezekiel. He said, I'm looking for a man or woman who would be willing to stand in that gap, to look out for the gap and to do something about the gap. There are gaps of unemployment. There are gaps in marriages, gaps in parent-child relationships. There are big gaps between the beautiful and diverse race groups in our country. And then the biggest gap of all is between people who have no excuse or should know about God's love and His desire to save every single one of us from an eternity without Him. There's hard work in transforming society. It's messy space whenever there's a gap. So many of us think, I just want to draw a little circle around my life. I would like comfort and ease, and anything that involves a gap generally disturbs a sense of comfort and ease. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the new emperor and a new empire, but he was Jewish, and he knew that God had a plan for Jerusalem. And uh, the book of Nehemiah is about his friends and family members coming from Jerusalem to visit him hundreds of kilometers away, and his first question is, how is Jerusalem? It's a question that some of us avoid asking about the city that's dear to us, in our case, the city of Durban. How is Durban? And he says, how can I be happy when the wall of my home city, the city of Jerusalem, is broken down? And the king says to him, well, what would you like? And he says, I want to go back with your permission, and I want to do something. And the king gives him permission. The king not only does that, but he gives him protection because it was dangerous places he was traveling through. And the third thing the king gives him is provision. He gives him a letter that says the, the king's keeper of the stores in that province was to give Nehemiah what he needed. And there's three things that stand out to me about this incredible story of Nehemiah. And you might like to go and read it if you've got some time this week. But the first thing that he does is, is the act of seeing. Seeing. If we're going to be a church that changes our nation, we've got to start with seeing. There was, it says twice in this passage, the first one we just read, that he went and examined the walls. He sees the broken bricks, the torn down walls. He sees the gates that have been burnt. With, without examining, without seeing, our hearts aren't easily moved to do something. The second thing, and I'm coining a word here tonight, so work with me if you wouldn't mind, is teeming. Seeing and teeming. It's not just one guy out there trying to be a hero all alone, Nehemiah going and pulling bricks. He gets some guys together, the, the city, and he says, chaps, look at this. We can all see the problem. Let us do something about it. And all of them say, we will. We're in. They start doing. And most gaps are fixed with those three points by seeing, by teeming, and then by doing. It lists another guy in verse 12, a chap by the name of Shalom. It says, he rebuilt a segment of wall with the help of his daughters. It's like a guy with five sons, okay, he'll sign up, but daughters, you know, maybe we'll do one or two other things in the city. I'm wondering what happened that night after this big endaba that the city of Jerusalem has, and the goldsmiths are picking a segment, the perfume makers, and a bloke named Shalom goes home, and he looks at his girls and says, well, would you like to join? And it says he rebuilt, this is physical labor of carrying rocks and stones. His team 
were his daughters, they didn't back out just because that wasn't a normal thing for them to do at that time. Then the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by, your, by the Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I will say to them, whatever you have done for the least of them, you've done it for me. And the only reason we can mind these gaps here on earth is because Jesus Christ saw the greatest gap was between every single one of us and the Father in heaven. It was a gap that none of us could cross. And he stepped out of the glory and the comfort and the joy of heaven into the squalor of earth. And stretching out his arms to die bridges the gap between heaven and earth and allows us to be joined together with the Father's love. Surely we of all people in the world should look for these small gaps in society to help send God's love into people's lives. We know that the greatest gap is the gap between man and heaven. But all these small gaps are an amazing way to show heaven's love to people.